<laughs> well, that shows people. And you are weird. It doesn't show you. Well, I can't hear him either. They're not talking. Well, there I am. Hello. Hello, Don. How you doing? Is that Tom? I was hoping I. Yep, that's me. Yeah, so glad. I... Yeah, there you are, my friend. Did you get my message that uh, Dale, Dale, and Bob are coming? Yes, I did. That's wonderful. Good, good. You're signed in. There's your name right there. No, it, it isn't. It says that Jim. Says, oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. Okay, well, here. Because I don't know if I've. Tom, um, please say hi to Francina. I will. John Francino says hi back. Okay. <laughs> um, this is Andrew. I have a question for you. I don't know what to do. Tom, Carr? Yeah. I have a question for you. You know those banners that you made that you brought to St. Cloud, that like uh, accordion thing or, you know, you pull out with the pole. Do you remember how much you paid for those? Uh, we got the three of them for under a thousand dollars U.S. Okay, thanks. Recording, 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 recording. I think we're recording. We're recording. We're recording. We're recording. Uh, now, Andrew, a question for you. Okay, go ahead, Joel. <laughs> All right, so uh, have you heard of the um, Cornfield Bomber? Mm, maybe. Why don't you elaborate? The, 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 I think it was an F-106 that crashed up in, um, or... It didn't crash. It landed in a cornfield in the snow up outside of uh, Big Sandy in Montana mm -hmm. without the pilot. Oh, my. <laughs> it, it apparently went into a tailspin. He realized he was in trouble. They were on a training mission, so he uh, ejected. But the plane somehow stabilized and then landed in the snow. Nice. And I was it's, wondering if you like, might know of any pictures or have any pictures of that. What do do? Um, I don't. I don't personally, but they're probably easy to find in a newspaper article or you know in the Air Force crash investigation report. Okay, I I was looking. To, I was I was wondering if they transported it by rail car back to. I think they took it back to California. And yeah, it, uh, that F one an F one oh six is small enough. They could have probably also trucked it once they took the wings off of it. So anything's possible. Yeah. I don't think that the meeting's open. Well, it should be open. So so it'd be the Air Force no one else yeah. crash open. investigations. Yeah, I believe somewhere down in Alabama, they have a repository of all their uh, reports and stuff like that. So, okay. If I find something, I'll let you know. All right. Thank you. Say, say Tom, I think uh, Bob Showers is, is coming also. As far as I know. Thank you. 
Who's got a speaker here? Well, I don't. Goodness gracious. Good John. Wow, impact. Hey, this is uh, Bob. Can anybody hear me? I hear you, Bob. Okay, great. I had, some trouble, I had some trouble logging in, so I was kind of fumbling around there. Looks like I also have the screen share active, so I think we're good. Yeah, I, I, had, some anxious, I had some anxious moments, too, but I'm okay now. Bob, it's good to see you, too. Uh, I'm trying to figure out who the host is of this meeting from a technical standpoint. It might be me. I'm not sure. Uh, Paul sent me a, a different link saying that I was the host. And I went to that link, but I was out there by myself. So I thought I better go to the other email and just try that. Uh, let me just look here. Uh, Does it look like you can get on? I hope. <laughs> well, there's a whole bunch of people here. Yeah, there's 41. Yeah, so let far. me just let me just try a screen share here. Looks looks like I can screen share. So we'll find out soon. And if we need to, I can certainly be the host. There's Tom Carr. Tom, I sent you an email. Yeah, I know. I, and I was having trouble, but I finally did get in. I don't know, is, uh, John, are you the actual host for us? I'm not sure. No, no, I'm not. I wish I was, but I'm not. <laughs> okay. It, it looks like, uh, you know, screen share is turned on. And when I, well, let me just, just for fun, I'm going to click on it and see what happens here. Yeah. Do you guys see that? Yep. Yeah, that's, good. that's a good yep, sign. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm going to. On here, and I guess I'm the host. Huh? The one thing I don't see is people in a waiting room. They're just all popping in here, so that's probably a good thing. Yeah, Paul turned off the waiting room. Is that was becoming problematic? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And there's I see two in chat. Uh, uh, Dell Stagger says he can't hear me. Uh. That will be at his end and not at our end. As, you guys, you guys are hearing me. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, I, hear you fine. I hear you fine, Bob. Good. Well, for everyone, uh, on here, my name is John Coy. I'm the uh, Jacob, and Jacob Bright and I are the actual host that are putting this on, not from a technical standpoint, but just from a background thing. And we want to welcome everybody to the uh, GNRHS Zoom. I believe this is our third one. We're trying to turn this into a, qu a quarterly thing. We crested over 
50 people last time. And I see tonight so far, 45 people are on here, which is really good. 45. And I'm really thrilled tonight that Bob Kelly, who is very, very well known in the society, is going to put on another one of his outstanding presentations. But I just wanted to formally welcome everyone to the Zoom. Hey, John, is there a way to make sure everybody's mics are muted so we don't have a problem like last time? Let's see. I might. Let's see if I have any control here. Yeah, Bob, Bob may be able to close to shut everybody off. Thanks. Let's see, I gotta figure out how to turn chat off there. What do I do? Chat. Okay, chat's off. Yeah, yeah, I'm on um I think um Doesn't look like I can turn mics off, but like uh John, I see yours on. I see uh Tom Carr, your mic is on. Yep. Scott, your Kermer, your mic's on. <clears throat> And I, I don't seem to be able to go in there and mute them. Let's see if I have a mute all kind of thing. I don't see one of those commands. But it may just have, if it becomes a problem, we may just have to stop and say, you know. Uh, I think each person has to turn their own mute. Yeah, off. it looks like it. Yeah, it looks like it. When you're done talking, you just mute it back. So, uh, Tom Carr, would you turn your mic off and let's just see what happens here. Most mics are off now. Uh, so, uh, Andrew, would you put your hand up if you can hear me? Okay, yeah, so it, it sounds like it's working. John Coy, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. You wanna you wanna wait a couple minutes here, John Coy, before we start, or wait to get people logged in? I had quite a bit of trouble getting in. I'm not shaking my head loud enough. No, go ahead and go. I just want to say before we start, Scott Kramer, can you hear me, Scott? Nod your head. Good. Thank you. I know you're a master model railroader. I just found out that uh, Richard Ramirez was too. And I want to talk to you before you get off this Zoom about a couple of things. So don't don't leave at the end. OK. All right. <laughs> I understand the head nod. Now shut up. <laughs> OK. You think we're ready to start, John? Uh, yeah, we should be. Um okay. And uh, but before you start, uh, if you could introduce yourself and uh, talk a little yeah. bit about your involvement with the society. Sure, sure. So I'm Bob Kelly. I'm with the GNRHS archive in the Seattle area. I've been a member for quite a long time. Probably I must have joined in early 90s, maybe. And uh, pretty active in working to have reference sheets created. I've helped author a bunch of reference sheets. I've done lots of lectures. Uh, at the conventions and so on, do a lot of background work with answering questions. We get several questions a week from people looking to do the research or whatever. I help answer those and uh, I'm helping to organize the Everett Convention. So when we get all done, if you want to talk about who the speakers are, or what's going on there, I can probably fill you in there too. So, and uh, prior to doing this, I worked at Boeing and every time I flew somewhere that had any great thing, Great Northern related, I would take an extra, some extra time and Go looking around and so on. So I'll go ahead and start here. Let's see if I can successfully screen share. Okay, are you all seeing uh, the title? Okay, yes. yeah. so let's just get going. What I'll do is I'll talk along here and uh, if somebody wants to monitor chat, and see if there's uh, questions or something fine, or I can answer questions at the back, and uh, we'll just go along. So here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about basically Stephen's past, 
and we'll talk a little bit about a lot of topics. The discovery about the switchbacks, the first tunnel, some snowsheds, this thing called the Horseshoe Tunnel, a little bit on the Wellington Avalanche. We'll talk a little about electric locomotives. Towards the end, we'll talk about Skykomish and a little bit about modern operations. And if we still have time at that point, uh, I got some uh, art artist uh, sketches and pictures. Uh, we've been very fortunate in this area to have lots of those. So I'll just show you a few. And uh, John Coy or somebody, if something goes wrong, start waving your hand. I can see your picture. So. So just so you'll know, uh, Stevens Pass, the, here's, you know, Wenatchee on the bottom right, Leavenworth Cascade Tunnel across the Skykomish, Monroe, and Everett. We're kind of going to talk between Skykomish and maybe some Leavenworth. That's about the breadth of uh, what we're talking about. Here's a little closer picture where you can actually see the various crossings uh, of, the, uh, of the pass. You can see the first one was with these switchbacks, and I'm going to show you some pictures of those. The second crossing was with this 2.6-mile tunnel, and then later they came down here in 1929, I think it was, and uh, built this 8-mile tunnel. So we'll talk about all of those elements as we go along. And when we talk about, uh, we'll talk about the Horseshoe Tunnel. Here's where the Horseshoe Tunnel is, and we'll get a good close look at that, too. And just to give you a feel for where the highway is today, if any of you have been up here, Here's where the highway is uh, on the bottom left there. If we start from Skykomish, we come up and make a big swoop and we come right along above the switchbacks. Let me cross and they're above us there. Go right literally across the pass is right where the initial railroad went uh, when you go across the pass there. And then on down uh, to, uh, well, the eight mile tunnel is in this area. here. So, you know, if you're up there and you want to Take a look at some of this stuff. It's you've got really good access, and you also have excellent views looking down into the valley here. This highway is about uh, maybe 800 to a thousand feet above, and you're looking down in the valley. So we'll start off with a little design and construction. So there's several people you should keep in mind here. Uh, on the left-hand side, a very interesting thing about discovery is that. Jim Hill had A.B. Rogers up there in 1887, looking around. And A.B. Rogers kept a very nice diary, and that's uh, on file here in the Washington State Historical Society. And he actually has copies of the letters that he wrote to Mr. Hill. And at late in the season in 87, he was uh, somewhat ill. But it actually sounds like he actually saw Stevens Pass, uh, was very close to it with an Indian guide. He wrote Mr. Hill that uh, the next explorer up here needs to do this, get this guy, this guy, go to this point and go to that low pass up there. So the big question here is, you know, did John Stevens have Mr. Rogers letters or not? That's an unknown. And then uh, Stevens was sent up there uh, uh, actually before he met Mr. Hill. And many people think he was working for Mr. Hill, but he was actually working for E.H. Beckler. And in Stevens' own writings, uh, he says he did not meet Mr. Hill until Mr. Hill gave a stop work order on everything, and Mr. Hill was coming out. And of course, John Stevens did not stop work. He kept everything working. And uh, he describes the, the day that he met Mr. Hill, that Mr. Beckler told uh, Mr. Stevens, at the end of the day, don't be surprised if there's one less young engineer working for the Great Northern. So, you know, but they did meet and it did proceed. So before he actually discovered this place, he had an inkling about it. I hadn't been there. He looked up a creek. He kind of thought that could be an interesting spot. He sent uh, Haskell up there with his with his uh, packer, John Maloney. And John Maloney ended up uh, being the founder of Skykomish. But Haskell appears to be the first engineer that actually arrived at Stevens Pass. And the guy that preceded him was John Maloney. The way Maloney describes it is he would cut trail ahead of Mr. Haskell and Mr. Haskell would follow along. So John Maloney actually claims in writing that he was the first of them there. But uh, take a close look at this tree. Mr. Haskell was pretty darn smart. He wrote his boss's name in a tree at the top. And uh, that tree stood there for a long, long time. I never saw it, but I was told it was sort of unceremoniously removed uh, when a parking lot was expanded. And it would be right at Stevens Pass today. And their design got kind of complicated. 
this is the west side switchbacks. I'll show you the east side switchbacks too a little later. But you can see that the concept they came up with was to do a switchback route going way up. Stevens Pass is sort of right-hand corner, come out back and forth, swing around, very 10-degree curve here. This is what Mr. Hill put a stop work order in on. And then you would come way up over here and you would zigzag yourself down about a thousand feet. Uh, someone needs to turn their mic off, please. You have to make a little box flattened out. Uh, in any case, uh, you can see how complicated this was. Now, an interesting thing happened just today. I got a uh, email from the Great Northern Society. The Great, you can ask them questions. And the email was from none other than a person named Luke Fur, or his grandfather was named Luke Fur, interested in an engineer who worked there. And right here is Luke Fur's camp. And right here is Luke Fur Creek. So I uh, today was emailing back and forth with him, and I sent him one of these, just one of those connections that happens uh, very commonly up there. Notice the Haskell's name is here on this creek, but this name didn't stick. Uh, if you look in Washington Geographic names, it's not there today. But uh, again, from about here to about down at Wellington is a thousand feet or so. So it's a fairly exciting view. Uh, the other thing during construction to remember is that, you know, this was horse carts and men and shovels, a little bit of mechanization, but not too much. You can see they had master craftsmen helping them with bridges. And uh, as near as I can tell, I have never found a design for this bridge. It looks to me like when they arrived on the scene, they figured what they needed and they built it. And just notice these rocks on the left-hand side there. I'll show you those rocks again in the future, uh, what it looks like today. This is uh, Deception Creek. Now, this is a picture I just got in the last few days from a gentleman's collection named Alexander McCullough, a Canadian. And he's in this picture. We're not exactly sure which one he is, but this may be him. These are, is, and he writes and he puts the names of these people on here, but it's kind of mixed up. And he was on the survey team in the switchbacks. And this was their home uh, after they actually got through and were doing improvements. And who do you think this gentleman is right here? That is John Stevens. Uh, probably the only picture I've seen of him that wasn't a portrait and in older life. But there's a young uh, John, John F. Stevens right there. And uh, this was, they apparently were parking this thing wherever they were doing their work, and they probably were living in it too. But I'm going to explore this uh, McCullough collection some more. Here's the kind of work they were doing, doing lots of this cribbing kind of thing, holding hillsides back. Uh, this maybe later probably turned into a snow shed. Because you notice right here, this appears to be an avalanche chute. And standing timber here, it looks like this is an avalanche chute. So they probably put this cribbing up here and then put a snow shed over the top. And of course, I'll talk about uh, snow sheds before long. But again, not much mechanism. You see a little steam boiler there on the right. But, you know, I'm not sure what this gentleman's pulling on with his horses, but, you know, a lot of this was labor. And then here's a picture that's often attributed to be, you know, near the time the last rail was uh, laid. And there are actually some sort of ceremonial pictures that are remembering uh, the last rail. But the thing to remember about those pictures is they're all fake because the last rail was late about 11 o'clock at night. So there were no actual pictures. And if there's a picture celebrating the last rail, which I'm sure many of you have seen, it's a staged picture a uh, few days later. So the thing to think about is lots of labor, lots of manual labor, some mechanism, and they worked in the winter. So it was kind of a hard place to work. Now I've talked about those switchbacks just a little, but let's sort of focus on them in a minute because you can still see them today. So here's the east side switchbacks. And what they did is they came up from the right. They came into a place called Cascade Tunnel Station. And it's interesting that they, they named it Cascade Tunnel way prior to a tunnel because they knew that's where the tunnel would start when they got to it. And they had switchbacks of, and they came and did this big loop with a Y in it. And by the way, Highway 2 today is just to the right of this loop. You can drive within, uh, I don't know, less than 25 yards of this area where the loop is. And this area here is the uh, Cascade Crest Trail today. So the long loop there that goes up to the pass was Cascade Crest Trail. And also the thing to remember, if you're in a passenger train and you sort of count forward, backward, forward, backward, by the time you got up to the pass, 
you were going backwards. In other words, you were be, the passengers were facing the east and they were actually traveling west at that point. But now let's remember this loop right here in the center. So see how easy it is today to see this loop. It's actually still there. There are these marks. Uh, the old line is definitely there. And notice that about just above the loop, you can see a line across the hillside there too. That's the that's the line headed straight for Stevens Pass. And you can see in the bottom center there, there's Highway 2. So that's how close you actually drive to the old switchback line uh, in today's world. Yeah. Now, if you look west, you also, I showed you that diagram. You can see here, now this was a longer, this was an early picture by A.B. Wilsey in the winter, but you can actually very closely see where these were. And today, Highway 2 is about right in here. So Highway 2 is just below the top switchback there. They should drive. So you're actually driving between the highest one and the next one down. This is the big lope that uh, Mr. Hill saw on, on the plans. And is more than 10 degrees. He put a stop work order in. And uh, Mr. Stevens did not stop. He kept building. So by the time uh, Mr. Hill got there, things were pretty well along. And, and the way uh, Stevens described it is that he came up on horseback from the east and he was uh, sort of in the prime of life, very in control, and uh, nobody said a word. And they tied their horses up and they walked out here somewhere. And no, nobody was, everybody was afraid to talk. And nobody said anything. And Mr. Hill looked for quite some time. And he then said, I don't think there's anything else you could have done. So that's the way Mr. Stevens describes it in his uh, uh, autobiography that's at Georgetown University. And of course, this was the first time they met. And uh, it's interesting that, of course, they formed a lifelong friendship also after that point. But everybody was afraid that he was going to kind of go crazy and redesign the whole West Side. Here's actually a picture from the top switchback. So on the left hand side, if you were to go to the left out of this picture, walk back towards where the photographer is and keep going, you would actually come to the ski area. Uh, today and this is the first top leg and you can look down now and see the next leg below and then to the right of that you can see uh, what's called Cascade Creek it flows right down to Wellington so big elevation drop here probably fairly exciting to ride in the train and especially in the winter uh, to do this much elevation drop uh, going down okay now the next short topic will be the first tunnel uh, and again, you can see here, the first tunnel was a lot of digging by hand to start with. Here's a train actually on the switchback headed for one of the uh, legs to the left. And this is the where the tunnel actually entered the side of the hill. And all of this has been cleared away left and right. And you can see they just dropped trees to get them out of the way. But this looks like there was some hand carts and horses and a little bit of track and a whole bunch of guys with shovels. There's no evidence here of much mechanism, but this would be the, the West Portal area we're looking at. Very few pictures of this tunnel under construction. They did not have an official photographer, and it was actually constructed by company forces. Right here in the bottom center is that same switchback line where we saw the train in the previous one. You'll notice here they've built a shed over the first part of the line going into the tunnel. And then on the right-hand side, they've created a uh, steam plant, steam and air, that was used to drive uh, uh, mechanisms inside the tunnel. They also have lots of housing here and a mess hall, some other shacks. But notice right here in the center, there's an unknown reason there's a gazebo of some type. And I've never been able to figure out what that is or what it's all about. I kind of doubt it was a hot tub, but I don't know. Uh, but anyway, this is a you know, picture taken uh, after it was pretty well constructed, they had like 600 men working here and had quite a community. They had quite a problem with uh, keeping men on site, and they had quite a turnover, like 25% uh, per month. Inside, you know, it was not good work. Uh, you, paid, you got a little bit more money on the inside, and you got less money on the outside. But uh, it was hard. It was wet. Uh, water running all the time. It was just the, the descriptions I read about are very, very unpleasant. So now they've got a, the first tunnel. 
and it finished in 1900. Uh, let's just go on now to talk snowsheds as we sort of take little bites of information here about what went on up there. You can see here a hillside and there's still some snow there. Uh, from the left, pretty obvious that this is a, some sort of an avalanche chute, but just look at the denuded trees. There's obviously been a lot of fires here probably caused by locomotives. And here's a good example of a snow shed and a track just sort of hung on the side of a hill. And of course the idea was that the snow would come down, slide across the roof and fall to the right and not uh, block your line. But you get a feel for the granite that they were digging through and the situations that they actually had. Here's another snow shed uh, down in the Tumwater Canyon. And I wanted to show you this one because notice the cribbing on the left-hand side. That's really all it's holding us here. They would build these cribs and then they'd fill them with rocks and then they would hang the whole uh, shed on that to really hold it to the hill. And these on top are 12 by 12 uh, timbers, solid 12 by 12, so they made them strong. And then if you look through uh, the shed, you see another shed. So in uh, the Tumwater Canyon, there were a whole bunch of sheds and they became quite a uh, maintenance problem, as you can imagine. None of this is treated wood or anything like that. Up at uh, Stevens Pass, uh, if you looked at 12 miles across Stevens Pass, they had nine miles of snow sheds. Here's uh, what you commonly see at Stevens Pass where they built a concrete back wall and then they hung their snow shed on that and those back walls are still there today. So it's pretty easy to see where they were. You can walk along them. The Iron Goat Trail walks right along several of them. And so real easy to see. And later I'll show you a picture standing on top of one uh, taken, uh, well, two of them actually, one of them taken about 1917 and one of them taken a couple summers ago. But you can see the type of construction here. Uh, here's a, the center post is a 20 foot uh, by 16 inches, you know, so that's a big strong post. Most of the wood and timber is gone, but a lot of these pins that you see pinned together thing, those pins are all over the place up there. This also gives you a good feel of what it was like uh, right down uh, at the, at the, actually, I'm going to show you the uh, Horseshoe Tunnel, but the Horseshoe Tunnel is inside this mountain over here. And you can see there's a man standing there to give you a little perspective. Uh, and this looks pretty beat up. You know, it's been there quite a few years and obviously had a lot of snow slide off it and go right on down to the next one and slide off of it too. And this one looks like they had an original roof and then they had an extension of the roof and then they had another extension of the roof to keep the snow farther away from the tracks. This is an area called today, it's called Korea, it was the station there. Now, here's a cool station inside of a snow shed. It's called Alvin at the time. Uh, later it was called Embro. And it's the only station I know of that actually was in a snow shed. And just, just keep this in mind, because I'm gonna show you a picture of this again later. But it uh, looks like a portable, Standard 12 by 34 portable depot that's maybe been added on to that they build inside of a shed. So it would have been fairly exciting there because it ends, you know, and the tracks are like right in front of the station. So a lot of snow probably ended up on the tracks. I can't imagine what it was like when it rumbled down on top of you. Though. So now let's talk Horseshoe Tunnel, which was very close to that station. They created a, to make a turn here, all the black areas you see are snow sheds along the line. They're like right below uh, 1716. And they had to figure out how to get turned around. They, to start with, they built a, a switchback that went, went way up the creek. And they did a temporary switchback here to get down onto the lower line. But later they came up with the idea of coming in here, building a horseshoe tunnel, crossing bridge 400 going into a tunnel inside the mountain, turning around and coming out here on bridge 401, but, and I'll show you a picture of that. And they used this quite a bit and it worked fine, but here it's obviously they're doing a study of maybe would it be better to go the other direction? Would it be better to put a new tunnel in, circle a different direction and come around to the line? This never actually occurred, it was a proposed tunnel they stuck with the uh, original horseshoe tunnel the whole time. But let me show you a picture of uh, Bridge 401 there. So here we are looking at Bridge 401 after it had been turned into steel. And it started off as wood, which would have been absolutely spectacular to see. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a telltale here. This would be the lower portal of the horseshoe tunnel. 
which went into the mountain, circled around, and came out about where the photographer is standing, about 70 feet above the track there and below. This is a major hiking takeoff point uh, today for the Iron Goat Trail. Here's another great picture uh, to the left here. Uh, you can see Bridge 401. You can see the line coming up through Korea. Bridge 401 goes into the mountain, comes around. Uh, I've actually, there was so much smoke in the tunnel that you, I have written accounts of people in the caboose getting off and re-meeting the train at the top. And they were actually, they put in actually wood steps to get from the bottom track to the upper track. And the crew would actually go up and wait for the train rather than ride through the tunnel and then hop back on. Here's another telltale. Also, the train's under a telltale and it's about to enter another tunnel there. So mountain railroading. You can just, you know, here's that entrance telltale. You can just, there's no fans blowing that smoke out of there. So it's going to be a while. So one of the things people know a lot about and hear a lot about is the avalanche. And so let's talk about that a little bit. I've got a couple of illustrations here to sort of set it up. The trains came from the right. They stopped at the Cascade Tunnel because they got blocked. Where they actually got blocked was out towards Windy Point over on the left-hand side. This was the big area where they had lots of trouble. And of course, they're coming down. Here's the Horseshoe Tunnel on the very left, they're winding their way down to Scenic. And uh, the Windy Point area was where they had most of the trouble. And after they sat a few days at Cascade Tunnel Station, they made pretty good progress out at Windy Point, and they also had a mail train join them. And so they had some pressure to get that mail train through because if it didn't arrive on time, of course, there were penalties. So they eventually brought the trains through the tunnel, parked both of them here at Wellington, along with a lot of rotaries. They had like six or seven rotaries operating in the area. They had actually borrowed rotaries from the NP and so on. So here's the situation on the March the 1st at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Both the trains are parked here. There's a work train parked at Wellington. There's a rotary that's out of commission. They had 802 and 800 working out towards Windy Point trying to get this open, but they had continuous slides. And the way they did this is they had two rotaries, one pointed north and one pointed south with locomotives in the middle. So if they got trapped trap with a small slide behind them, they could use the rotary to get back to pulling water. What actually happened was this 808 kept working and never actually stopped, but 802 and 800, they got stopped. They could not get back to the slide behind them. And they actually had to start chopping wood and melting snow to keep it, keep the locomotive alive. And the crew walked back over the top of the slide. And then about two o'clock in the morning, the avalanche came down. This was a slab avalanche uh, and not a lot was known about slab avalanches at the time. It's described as maybe 14 to 20 feet thick, about 3,000 feet long, and it slid like a slab. So when it came down, all this equipment ended up down here in the river. And that, uh, of course, woke up the people in town. The, the passengers had been aware of the problem. They'd been hearing slides. There was a little bit of panic uh, amongst them. In the days prior to the avalanche, a few of them had walked out to here and then slid on their butt down to here uh, on our telegraph line to get out to safety. But there's, there was no uh, actual telegraph available here. Uh, you had to go down, uh, I don't know, five or five more miles to actually reach a telegraph. So let me show you what happened. You can see the destruction is pretty heavy. Uh, when, the, when the slide came off the hill, I took all the timber with it and anything in its way got just flipped and rolled down the hill. And including, uh, you know, all the elements here. Uh, on the right-hand side, there's an electric locomotive, coal car, some sort of wood car to the left. All these bags here, that's mail that was thrown out of the mail train. And one of the problems they had right away was they had to guard and protect the mail. Uh, and they had to put armed guards beside it. And they started, as they found it, they uh, just piled it up. But you can just imagine what this was like if you had been living in one of the shacks and you were woken up and you came out with a lantern and a shovel in the dark. You would have had experienced a lot of lightning because they were having a snowstorm and a lightning storm at the same time. So it would have been a fairly eerie kind of thing. Some people survived on the surface. They were thrown out. Some people they actually dug out. 
some a few people dug themselves out, but the majority of the people did not get out. And again, you can just see the situation here taken. This was taken by J.D. Wheeler a day or two later. He walked in from the east, from Leavenworth. Uh, it was uh, in today's terms, maybe you could have dealt with more of this. But in the terms of the day, which is how you have to judge it, it was a pretty big mess. Took them about 12 days, lots of dynamite. They talk about car loads of dynamite that had to be carried up on people's backs because the snow had become something like clay. Here we are at Windy Point, kind of just to the right of the explosion area there where you see the smoke. And there's a snow shed, and that's the Windy Point right there. So this was one of the places where they're having the most trouble. And here's uh, one of the survivors. The first training came in from the east, and there all the survivors that were taken care of at Wellington uh, left towards the east if they wanted to, and they all did uh, want to. Uh, they had set up a you know a hospital, and they had brought in nurses and doctors and so on to take care of people, do the best they can. There's a lot of stories about what that was like, and uh, some really good books about that avalanche too, if you'd like to read them. So. Let's move on now. We're going to move from, you know, that avalanche to the second tunnel, which was one of the other main elements of what the history is up there. If you, uh, there's a couple of things I'll show you here. Look at the top first. You can see the uh, sort of pictorial description of the short, my, short tunnel. And you can see the new tunnel at the bottom. And then you see the pioneer tunnel. And the way this tunnel was actually built, is the first thing they did was start digging this pioneer tunnel uh, to a point about two thirds of the way through. And you'll notice every now and then in the pioneer tunnel, there's a crossover. And they would cross over once the tunnel was completed. And then they would start digging in the, in the center of the eight mile tunnel and then hauling debris out of the, uh, 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 the pioneer tunnel. The reason is right here at the West Portal, Going was very, very, very slow because this was an old avalanche area and they had lots of problems with cave-ins and so on. So the Pioneer Tunnel was something that came from Europe and the distance between the center of the main tunnel and this tunnel was very precisely calculated uh, to make sure that one didn't affect the other. But the crossovers were to designed to take material out. Now notice at Mill Creek, they also built a shaft, 622 feet down. They had four elevators and they could, uh, once they got to the bottom, they could start digging east and west. So they went ahead and started digging from there. And they hauled all this stuff up to the top in uh, elevators and dumped it. And this valley now here is just full of the muck from the tunnel. And there's wonderful pictures of all of this operating by Lee Pickett, who was the official photographer. And there at the University of Washington, he had the permission to stop work to take pictures. So at the bottom, you can kind of see the two tunnels in context. There's a whole story about how the, the short tunnel was used to locate the first tunnel and uh, how the, the triangulation and surveying all went on to do that. There was actually a plumb bob in the Mill Creek shaft, uh, 622 feet down. They put it in a 50 gallon drum of oil to kind of damp it so it wouldn't swing so much. It was actually a part of their surveying. So there's a huge story here about this tunnel. Here's the West Portal Camp. The tunnel is just to the left, the center there, the portal of it. And you can see a lot of the materials here. They have concrete plants and all kinds of drill sharpening stations and you name it. And to the right, uh, off the picture, there's lots of housing. And notice above the tunnel portal, there's a boardwalk that goes up there and there's a camp above the tunnel. That camp's still there today. It's real obvious you go walking around in there. Uh, there was a camp. There's going to be all kinds of dishes and you name it, uh, whatever they walked away from. A lot of these residences were actually just tents on platforms. But the uh, last time I was up there, there was, you know, things like uh, uh, trees growing up through the middle of an early vehicle and stuff like that. But again, construction here was pretty labor intensive. They did use automated drilling and so on. They used a technique where they would at the top, they would cut the heading first, and the heading always stayed ahead of the rest of the tunnel. But notice all the holes drilled here <clears throat> in the boxes of dynamite. They're actually getting ready for a shot here where they would fill all these with dynamite, including the heading, and then they would step back and blow it off, and then they would just keep this process going all the way through. 
or the heading sometimes got too far in advance of the rest of it, and they would have to stop and let the rest of it catch up. And of course, they would come to rivers in here, and the water would flow, and it would rain, you know, sheets of water. It was kind of a mess. Um, I've been in there a couple times in the current tunnel and stopped about halfway through to get out of the truck. And if you do that and put your finger in the water, it's about 100 degree water. So a lot of it was also hot water. You can see here a much more mechanism used. You can see a shovel in the background. You can see an electric locomotive there in the foreground uh, there to get the muck out of here. This was a much more mechanized uh, tunnel. And of course the lining and everything was, they had special machines for that. It turned out to have a nice concrete lining the whole way through. It's the same concrete lining you see today, by the way, if you go in there. Um, and uh, the uh, electrics, of course, went right through. So they had to have cables hanging down for them and so on. But uh, today when you go in there, it's uh, pretty darn dark and uh, water is pretty hot. Now this is a unique part for me anyway. When they came out of the tunnel on the west end, the, the grade was about 40 feet above where it used to be. And they built this uh, big trestle. And of course they had to use muck from the tunnel or rocks and so on called muck to fill this whole area in. And it turns out it was right in front of the scenic hot springs hotel. And after a while, you can see that the filling got actually up to it. It didn't actually crush it or anything. But it got to the point where it would be no longer usable in today's line and is up here. Uh, and, you know, if you go to this location today, you find a few bricks down there, but not much is left. The chimneys are all gone. People have salvaged them and so on for other purposes. But kind of a unique situation to be a place where you're living. A lot of the engineers lived here and so on. Now, another big element up there in this history are the electric locomotives. Uh, Here's one of the first box cabs here. Father Dale wrote a, a reference sheet just here not too long ago about the box cab locomotives, the first ones that worked there. The interesting thing about them, this is the West Portal. And notice right at the top, there's this long area here at the top. That's uh, the old switchback line that we've seen in two or three of the pictures already uh, when they were, were building, same place. And the tunnel, uh, of course, all lined as much as possible. Today, if you would go in the tunnel, it'd actually be kind of foolish if you did. But if you were in there, uh, if you look up, there's been quite a few things come down. And you can look actually through holes. And you between the uh, concrete and the actual rock of the tunnel, you find cordwood. They, put, they just filled the space up with cordwood. And you see a lot of old rotten cordwood there today. But what's happened to this tunnel is about 1,000 feet in, it's collapsed. And then behind it, the water has built up. So there's about a million gallons of water in there now. And this would be a very stupid place to be because there's been four occasions when the dam broke and the water flowed out. And uh, it's been documented by the Forest Service because they go to check on the place or observe from helicopters. And you can see that in the snow in the winter, all of these occurred in the winter when the water was really flowing, you would see a nice uh, high dirt mark on the snow outside the tunnel. So today, they discourage you from going here. Uh, these guys were also, low, they were in active use. They went into use uh, just about six months before the Wellington Avalanche. And here's uh, one of them being recovered uh, from the, the ravine uh, after the avalanche. They actually put them back on their own wheels, took them to Everett, and they put them back in service. So they just completely, even though you see all this damage, they all actually went back in service. Later, they had bigger, stronger, better uh, electrics. But look how many there were here parked at Skykomish. Kind of amazing. Here's the roundhouse on the left. Uh, any of you who've been to uh, Skykomish, you know, there's the hotel that's there today. This is the Cascadia Inn prior to a fire that occurred and took the top floor off. But uh, that hotel is there today. Here's the top of the depot right here on the south side. But it was a big deal place. There was a lot going on here. Lots of interchange with uh, steam and electrics, uh, lots of men, lots of maintenance. It was a lot happening in the sky. And they had, you know, various sizes of them as, you, as it got more and more into this. They had more and more power. This happens to be a picture of the last electric locomotive that had left Sky Comish and it was towing all of the other electrics. And they stopped right here to take a picture. They stopped several places. 
This is Highway 2 on the upper left, right at Scenic, and they stop to take pictures. And this is Ted Cleveland. Some of you who have been to Skycomish may have met Ted. He's still with us today, and he has excellent memory, and he was able to, a young fireman at the time, and he has the clearance form and the train orders in his pocket at home. Uh, and he'll get them out and show them to you. Uh, of this last guy. When, these, when this got to uh, Wenatchee, they turned the power off. And of course, at both ends and several places in the middle, they had enormous amount of power coming in. This is the, the uh, station at Skycomish, and people call it the powerhouse, but it was really a frequency converter because power was coming in at 60 cycles and they were using it at 50. So that's what was happening inside this building. And this would be the feeds from the power company. Down in Tumwater Canyon, they were, had a dam set up that had used from the very beginning, and it was feeding the system. They also got power from the power company in Wenatchee. So there's a similar building in Wenatchee, which is still there today, uh, that is used as a warehouse, I think, today. But they were feeding power from both ends. So today, if you've been to Skycomish, and if you've been out and rode on the uh, little seven-inch gauge railroad, this door right here has tracks, and you can stand on these tracks today uh, right near the edge of the railroad. They're still there today, and you can see them. But now let's talk sky. A lot of you know I volunteer at the museum there and do a lot up there. Uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about sky. The first name you can find on a blueprint or find in any reference to for Sky Comish was, and it was called the flat spot at the bottom of the 2.2% grade. That was literally the name they gave uh, to Sky Comish on the very first maps and plats that they did. And this is a sketch and it's actually fairly accurate. You can see a uh, coal tower on the right. You can see the uh, ho you can see a hotel back there with smoke coming up. That was uh, what preceded uh, what the hotel today. There's a it says post office. That would be the equivalent location of Maloney's store today. It's not the same building. There actually was a fire. There was a fire and rebuilding here, but it's not too bad. You know, I mean, there's a couple of guys in the foregrounds that look like they're pilgrims or something with rifles that, you know, that's just artist license. And the timber pictures are just show that exactly the same tall timber. Later, of course, there was a really happening place, a lot going on. Uh, you can make a lot of decisions about the age of things by looking at these things. Notice the coal tower is still there. And that came down in 1911. Here's the Skycomish Hotel, which is there today. This is the Maloney Warehouse. So these are the kind of things that help you uh, figure these out, figure out the dates. This is looking uh, due east. And if you look close in the background, you can also see that there's a crossing here. That's the uh, lumber outfit that's crossing here to go to the trees over to the left across the river. Here's another view later. This picture was taken from the top of the water tank. And of course, you can see really well here the, the railroad for the logging company. Again, the depot, many of you saw the depot when it was on the north side. So we know this is prior to 1922 because it was on the south side. And you can see now they've uh, switched to oil. The coal tower is gone. And you can actually see the oil tank and the oil sump just beyond it where uh, all the problems occurred uh, when the oil leaked out of it and leaked all the way over and into the river. Also, if you've been up there today, on the left-hand side, there's a small house here. That house is there today, same exact house. Just to the left of it is the tavern. You might've been in the tavern. It's been, of course, burned and rebuilt and so on. This would be the area of uh, the Cascadia. This is prior to the Cascadia when it was uh, a boarding house. Now that good Lee Pickett photo, and he took pictures from here frequently. There was quite a community there. These are the Tegler kids, uh, but I want to put this in because there were hundreds and hundreds of people living there. And there's hundreds of stories. We hear the stories all the time. And just like I was talking to that gentleman today about his grandparents and so on, they just go on and on and on, uh, sort of to humanize the place and tell you what it was really like. And there's lots of letters these kids wrote to their grandparents and so on. Now here we are in the 50s, maybe late 50s. Uh, in the center, the frequency converter station, uh, the Maloney store, the Skycomish Hotel, the store and the hotel are there today. This building is there today. School, uh, 
was I think built in the teens. Or no, it was built during the Depression. Right after the Depression is when that was built. But you can get a pretty good feel for it. The bridge, if you've been up there, you, that's the bridge across when you come into town. The small railroad, the Great Northern and Cascades, is located right over here today. And uh, this door right here in the Frequency Converter Building is the same door with the trackage that was inside, right inside. That trackage can be found today. Now, as we end here, I just want to talk a little bit about the historical perspective and what's going on up there today. And we will have been through all the basic elements of the history. Of course, each of these have uh, enormous information behind them, and you could do a presentation on each of them. Remember, I mentioned that the station inside of a snowshed. Here it is, about 1917. At that time, it was called Embro. It changed from Alvin. And the photographer was standing on the snowshed, the back wall, probably, of the snowshed, looking. You can see all the temporary buildings and the lean-tos and so on. Uh, the houses on the left, you can still walk around up there and uh, find stuff looks like where a house was. On the right-hand side, this was more of a summer kind of thing. It was empty in the winter or not used, or they fell down and put back up. Now, let me show you a picture here taken about four years ago up from exactly the same location. So here's the back wall of the snowshed that I'm standing on. And, you know, out here somewhere is where the depot was. And. The tracks are off to the right. Here's my wife waiting for me. And we're on the uh, Iron Goat Trail uh, uh, along here, another hiker down there. But you can just see here, you know, the kind of changes. And this is very important when you think about the historical perspective to keep these things in mind, what was and what is. Another thing we looked at once before was the bridge here at Deception Creek. And notice those rocks on the left-hand side there behind a tree. Here's what that looks like today. So PNSF goes right through there. Of course, they've got a more a stronger bridge, but it's in the same place. And by the way, if you're rail fanning, this is a you can drive to this location and essentially take this picture from your car. It's a, a beautiful place to go on a sunny day. Down in Sky, uh, things haven't changed a lot. I mean, that's the Maloney store. It's been refurbished on the left. On the right, you know, we see the same hotel that was there. The, I mean, that hotel was standing there during the avalanche when that happened. The store was there. They took supplies out of the store. So a lot of what's in Sky is, you know, there's a lot there that holds together uh, from history, and you have to keep that in mind, too. Things have changed, but a lot of the key parts are still there. Amtrak comes through twice a day, once in each direction, like a lot of passenger trains used to. And they still have freight operations, and they still have a lot of snow trouble. Uh, this shows the, uh, the depot there on the, on the north side of the track. It's now back on the south side of the track, and it was shortened after the big oil cleanup that occurred uh, to its original length of 60. And uh, uh, But the same stuff's going on there. They didn't have much snow this year, but they put a, two snow plows up there every winter to be ready for this. This, I think, was about eight years ago when I took this picture. And things had pretty much come to a halt by the time that happened. Uh, today, recreation has become a really big element. Earlier it hadn't, but in the last 15 years, it's become a really big element of skiing at the pass, hiking on the trail, people coming to town. Uh, for those reasons, a lot of people. And there's also a few elements around the area. This is at one of the trailheads uh, right along the highway. They put a caboose there. Help, I helped to actually refurbish the thing. You don't go inside it, but, uh, uh, you know, just sitting there, uh, the strangest thing I ever saw was in the middle of the winter, uh, snowboarders were skiing off the top of it. <laughs> and if you get up on the trail, I mean, I can't, I don't know if I could get up here anymore at 76 years old. You get some fabulous views. Uh, we're looking uh, across at Highway 2 here from Windy Point. So this is right at Windy Point. It's about 800 feet down to the tracks to the right, looking across. And you know, the coolest thing I think up here is you, you've got uh, eagles and hawks and stuff sailing around and you're looking at the top of them. You're looking down on them, which is just a great, it's a great place to have lunch. By the way, for those of you who have been there, you maybe have taken part in this. There's the uh, most scenic outdoor toilet in the world is at this location. I call it the out without the house because it, it has the pit, but it has no house. 
So you get a whole view of the world there uh, when you're using. Now, I want to talk about one cool thing that's occurred. We've had a wonderful complex of artists, you know, document what was up there. And so there's lots of prints and lots of artists available have done work up there. This is the Craig Thorpe. Craig has done several of these. This is that um, Gainer. The train is actually on the old line. And you can see the new line through the tunnel being built in the background. Uh, but the, the, the quality of the art we've had created up here is just helps preserve the history. Here's a Jack Christensen. Uh, he's a steam locomotive engineer. He's 94 years old. He still paints. And here's one he did for me at Bern. Uh, just, you know, excellent watercolor artist that has taken pictures of things he remembers. He's made over 150 trips through the line. He's been through the tunnel 100 times, he says. And uh, it's just a fascinating to get a guy with that kind of experience uh, doing the painting. Here's a Mike Pearsall. If any of you have the uh, big uh, Charles Wood book, uh, Mike did lots of paintings for that big book. This is one of them. This is the east portal of the uh, two and a half mile tunnel. Uh, here's a Jim Jordan uh, coming out the west portal of the uh, eight mile tunnel. And Jim is still painting and still sells pictures. If you're interested in one of these, you can go look up Jim Jordan's art and you can buy one. Here's my favorite. Uh, I helped uh, Larry Fisher with a lot of pictures and so on when he built this. I worked with his art agent, who's just a great guy. And uh, he, you know, tries to get pictures and all the elements and the history and the color and all this kind of stuff of a site uh, before Larry uh, paints a picture. And then uh, he talks to the locals. And so I sent probably 25 or 30 pictures, similar locations, similar angles, not so much up in the air, but what were the hills like in the background? And then this is what he turns out with. And uh, so it's probably my favorite picture at Sky, maybe because I helped also, you know, provide the early information. Uh, and anybody who is interested in Larry Fisher uh, paintings or drawings, just email me and let me know. I know the art agent really well, and I'm sure, you know, you could get a real nice discount for you. I could get you introduced and you could use my name. Uh, but they're very realistic and he's still painting. I recently had helped him with uh, painting in Spokane and now he has another painting in Spokane. So I'm learning a lot about Spokane. We're getting pictures of all these areas that he's uh, doing paintings. I think that may be my last slide here. Yeah, let me on share and I'll answer questions. Okay, I guess uh, the thing to remember is uh, unmute yourself if you have a question. And uh, who wants to start? Bob? Yeah. Scott Kramer. I that, got, picture done, that picture done by Larry Fisher was done for me. Yeah, I knew. I didn't know if you were on or not. I couldn't tell if I saw your name, but yeah, I know you were the person who actually inspired him to do it. Yeah, it, it, it was a, a nice deal. Uh, I met him down at the uh, NMRA train show in Cincinnati with his manager down there, and we talked about it, and he came to my house and everything else, and I was very honest with him. I said, I'm, I'm working right now, and I'm consulting, and if I keep doing that, I can afford the picture. And if I don't keep working, I can't. And I stopped working. <laughs> so somebody else bought the original. I didn't get it. But he and he was really great. We went over all the details. And, uh, you know, I know you've supplied him a lot of information. But that's how that picture finally came to pass. Yeah, that's great. Mostly what uh, artists do, I work with a lot of artists and professional artists. And what they do is they paint a picture when they have a commission. Yep. And sometimes they'll do one out of the blue. But mostly there, I've already got a commission, and then they retain the copyright to it, and then they would sell prints as well as providing it uh, to the uh, person who commissioned. Getting yeah, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Other questions, just uh, get us our attention, or John, if you want to monitor it, fine. I don't know if there's any questions in, uh, in the chat, but uh, just speak up. I can't see you all. Yeah, I did. I did see uh, one in the chat. It was at Tunnel 401. Does oh, it bridge bridge 401? Oh, bridge bridge, excuse me, I can't read. Yeah, so so the uh at the horseshoe tunnel, there are two bridges you enter on a bridge and you exit on a bridge. You enter on bridge 400 and you exit on that big dramatic bridge 401. Now, the cool thing about that bridge today is that uh, the hiking trail goes right down to the river, crosses the river, and goes up the other side, and you can see all the stanchions and so on. 
Was there a specific question about that bridge? He was just asking if bridge 401 still exists. No, it does not exist other than the pilings are there, uh, the concrete pilings, the actual, uh, you can actually walk and stand and sit by them. I had lunch sitting on one one time. Uh, they're pretty big and strong. Uh, on top of the concrete at the very top, they put a granite block, and that's what actually interfaced with the, uh, the metal. It was built in wood to start with, and then I think about 1900, they converted it to steel. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question about the uh, electric locomotive you uh, had there that was uh, leaving Sky Comish and taking the other the three guys were standing in front of it. That was a honking big locomotive. Was that was that uh, was that the way it was built, or was that some type of aberration to uh, house all the electric motor equipment? Actually, they got bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger, and that's the way it was built. They may have that may have been a conversion. They built a couple that looked like that, and then they converted a couple of the square ones to look like that. I forget the actual number of that one there. But, yeah, so they looked like that at the end. In fact, they got so big that uh, they couldn't actually go on some of the bridges and, and curves. They had to slow down to, like, one mile an hour because they were afraid they were going to, you know, trip it and fall off. Above that was the 5018, so that's as built. Okay, yeah, that's the 5018, okay, and that's the way they built it. The, but the, the, the cool thing about it is there's so much in our reference sheets that describe that to you. Uh, the uh, uh, Don Pavi and I did a sheet on the electrical system. There's two or three sheets on the various electrics. So if you want to read about them, you got an easy chance just to pick up those older reference sheets. Bob, excuse me. Uh, the big ones in the photo they're referring to are Class W1 made by General Electric back in the late 40s. Yeah. Those were the last electrics. Yeah, As I, I think, recall, they were, they were, think they were, there were two of them, I think, weren't there? Two yeah, they were, they were like, I think they were rated 5,000 horsepower each, right. double-ended yeah. cab. Yeah. They were freaking enormous. If you look at them in the scale to an F unit, they were just huge. Yeah. And, and uh, the, uh, Union Pacific converted them into something weird after everything was done. Yeah, and the cool thing about them is, uh, Ted Cleveland's still alive, lives in Skycomish, and he ran them. So you can go talk to him about them. It's really kind of a fun thing. Ted is very interesting. Yeah. The uh, precursors to that uh, W1s were the Y1s and the Z1s. And the Z1s were the earlier electrics that they used on the old line. And then eventually the Y1s came in and they used those on the uh, the rest of the line from 29 through, uh, I guess, into the 30s, late 30s. Yeah, I'm not an expert on them. I know I've helped uh, several people with reference sheets. The last one I worked on was the tunnel motors, which were the very first few. And I think they called those Zs, and then they had more Zs, and, yeah. uh, and then the Ys, and so on. But yeah, there's lots of documentation available uh, on those. those. Those engines all ran until 1956. 56, okay. Yeah. One, of the, one of the square uh, motors that uh, crashed by the Foss River Bridge, that was one that they took back, I think, to Seattle or Tacoma and built it and put those double-ended cabs on it. That was one of their first ones, but I don't know what number they were. I, it wasn't was... 500 series, but it crashed and... They rebuilt yeah. it. When they Came rebuilt off. it, it became five five zero one one. That's what I thought, but I couldn't say yeah. for sure. I had the opportunity to sit on a bench at the depot in Skycomish and spend about a half hour with the person who was on that locomotive when it went off and tell his story. It was absolutely fascinating. And in the end, you know, he said to me, when we're all gone, I just want you to know what happened is we all went to sleep. So they were so tired. They were so tired, and it was hot and warm. And he said, "You don't tell anybody this till I'm gone." But he said, "We went to school." So that's what he said happened. Uh, my father-in-law was a engineer, and he did the electrics for a long time uh, on the Cascade Division. And his brother-in-law was one of the gentlemen that got killed on that wreck. The guy I talked to had been sent back 
he went back into the back end of the locomotive to get his galoshes because he knew they'd be stopping in sky and he had him back there trying to warm them up and he said that's probably the reason he survived okay I read anything, that, anything else I read, that, I read that book about the uh avalanche there at um wherever it was and they were talking about the i don't i guess it was a pretty popular book here a few years back uh, and it was staggering to think that the only way they could get the snow away from the tracks was to send a crew out there and shovel it by hand. Yeah, and I think, you know, the other interesting thing is that there were sort of three books, if you think about it. In about 1960, there was a book called Northwest Disaster by Ruby L. Holt. And about half the book is on the avalanche and half the book's on a different disaster. And then the one you're probably thinking of is The White Cascade by Gary Christ. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one that if you haven't read it, you really ought to. It's called Vis Major. Uh, Vis Major is like uh, Act of God in Latin. That's by Martin Burwash. He wrote his book from the perspective of the train crew as opposed to from the perspective of the passengers. And it's fiction because he made up the dialogue. But everything that happens is historically correct. It's absolutely fascinating and a different perspective from the perspective of the crew. Um, say, say, Bob, uh, real yeah. quick, just so everyone knows, there there is a virtual rail fan live camera at Sky now. Does yeah, there sure to... is. I uh, I was I took a picture of it and I was going to put it in the, at the end of my presentation, but they're very sensitive about that. And I emailed them and said, "Can I do that?" And they hadn't got back to me today, so I didn't put it there. But yeah, any I uh, just go to uh, go to YouTube and type in Sky Comish Rail Cam, it'll right. pop right up. Right. And uh, you can watch it live 24 hours a day, and uh, unless the power goes off, of course. That's of course. very funny, Bob. Excuse me. I'm watching a freight westbound leaving Sky right now on yeah. YouTube. The Empire <laughs> Builder just went through Sky eastbound about 10 minutes ago. Yeah. There's a yeah, freight leaving about... westbound on, and I'm watching you, Bob, while I'm looking up and looking at a freight leave town. Excuse me, one last thing. On the subject of wildlife on the Iron Goat Trail, about Eight years ago, my wife and an adult son, we did the trail from upper to lower. And my son stopped up ahead of me at the time. He was in his 20s, and uh, he had his camera out, and he was taking a photograph of a tree next to the trail, a la the track. And this tree had been completely ripped of its bark from about a seven-foot elevation down to the soil. Yeah. And it was clawed off, just absolutely clean down to white lumber. And so I got to this thing and I'm uh, pondering it and I'm thinking, wow, that was some crazy animal. Well, obviously a black bear got on it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Of interest today, March 26th, uh, the news currently today says the National Park Service has been advocating reintroducing grizzly bears into Washington yeah. state. And as of today, March 26th, the governor of Washington is throwing in uh, his commentary to the effect of uh, it would create a natural balance again as kind of like an advocate. So uh, black bears have their own world and future of grizzly bears here might uh, be another that could be interesting. I, I tell that, I tell kids yeah. when kids see that uh, tree, I tell them it might have been a dinosaur. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Bob. Bob, I yeah. have a question about um, the Wellington um, disaster. Sure. You talked you talked about uh, J.D. Wheeler uh, hiking up from Leavenworth. Um, there, as I understood it, there was a contingent of men that came from Leavenworth. Um, I know that most of the medical folks came from Everett. Everett. I, I heard that there was a physician that came from Leavenworth and made that two day walk or hike as well. Do you I think, have? I think you may be correct because I think uh, Dr. Stockwell was the one that actually stayed there and took care of everybody. But there was one other physician there ahead of time. I have never found his name, but I was told that he did come from Leavenworth and a contingent walked up. They actually could ride up a little ways, but they essentially had to walk from Leavenworth. And one of the people who walked with them, obviously, was uh, J.D. Wheeler, who took those pictures he sold as postcards. 
Yeah, I, I know his name. His name was uh, G.W. Hoxie, H-O-X-S-E-Y. He was a uh, great northern uh, surgeon stationed. In yeah, I think I've seen his name on timetables. Yeah, as stationed, yeah. Uh, stationed in Leavenworth. Yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, but I I wonder is there any other information about is is there anything written from the, the Leavenworth side about how they got up there and you know um, the folks that they brought back because the first train came from that side. I understand a the, lot. The best that. the best source I have found in Leavenworth is the Leavenworth Echo newspaper archives, mm -hmm. and those are actually online. The state of Washington has them yep. online. And, you know, it's kind of hard to read those things, but they put little stories in there about who stopped on the train today as they were passing through town. That's where I would go to look. It's uh, I've got some of them, but, uh, you know, log on to like the State Library of Washington and look for uh, Leavenworth Echo. It probably is there. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. Who else has a question? Bob, the... Uh... This presentation that you put on tonight, is that going to be available or can is there a way to get a hold of it? Well, I, yeah, I, 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 I mod, I'm actually modeling Monassi to oh. Everett in, the night, in 1929, January, just after they opened up the 7.8 mi mile tunnel. And I'm featuring the exchange from steam to electrics at Wenatchee yeah. and then switching back to Wenatchee or to... Yeah. Steam um, in uh, Skykomis. When I logged and, on, it said it was this was being recorded. I'm not sure who was recording it, but it might be Paul O'Neill, who's a public relations guy for GNRHS. So I would. There were, some, there were some interesting pictures that I haven't seen in some of the books before that, yeah, that well, I got you, collected you know, on you it. Can certainly, and, you can also email me, and I'll be glad to share pictures from the Skykomis collection to anybody. Okay. All righty. I appreciate it. Let's go on there. Are there other questions? Just go ahead and speak up. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to find out information of a gentleman named Ellis that he worked at the uh, locomotive shops in Everett. Uh, he retired probably in the late 70s, if that. Uh, he was a friend of our families, but I did not know his first name. I was young in high school and during that time, so... So at I Everett, think so. there were a, a couple of the shops at Delta were probably at Delta Yard. And I okay. don't know of any personnel records that have survived. But the thing you might be able to do is find the union uh, seniority lists uh, for that area. So that might be a thing you could pursue to see, get his full name, maybe. And the day I... he hired in and what, what he did, that might be a first <laughs> approach. And then... Once you've got that, you might actually get a social security number, too, because sometimes those were on those things. And then maybe some uh, professional genealogical research uh, might help you. OK, yeah, because they're my parents have passed and they and he's passed. So it's it's. Uh, I know he, I think the supervisor of locomotives or something like that at the time, yeah. so. And those are those are kind of by the way those are kind of hard things to trace but I wouldn't give up I would try you know the genealogical side I would try the, to maybe to get a full name I would uh, try a seniority list approach and you, those things do pop up All right thank you Yeah There were a couple other books that uh, went along with the, there's one called Stevens Pass Gateway to Seattle written by Joe right. Joanne Rowe. Yeah, yeah, I've met Joanne, uh, and she's done some lectures up at Skykomish for us. Yeah, it's a good book. It covers all sort of all the elements of Stephen's path. And there's another one uh, I survived by Lauren, L A U R E N T A R S H I S. I think she is the executive editor of Scholastic Magazine, and she writes these books called I Survive, and she's done like 40 of them, uh, and they're sort of aimed at uh, middle-aged uh, teenagers, maybe young teenagers, and uh, she was up in Sky a couple years ago, and we did an interview and so on. She was researching her book on I Survived the Wellington Avalanche, and I think it's uh, I think they're written for girls, so I think it's kind of aimed at a, a young girl's, uh, you know, 
area. Yeah, I hiked lots of years ago uh, down around uh, the Wellington, and you could still find chunks of trains and metal wrapped around trees and stuff. Uh, but a lot of that got moved after they put the uh, the big cement snow shed in. I think they started building that around 13 or 14. And uh, by 1915, it was all operational. And it's yeah. still there, still standing. There's still there's still things there with wrapped around trees. That's pretty easy to find if you go down over the hill. But yep. actually, one of, the, one of the things to remember if you do go down there is uh, once in a while you meet a ranger down there forest ranger and it's illegal to pick anything up so just a warning <laughs> i've met people down there in custody of the ranger <laughs> <laughs> other questions or comments or i'm too old to go down there now i kind of feel the same way actually <laughs> hey bob are there any preserved great northern electric locomotives uh not that i know of all right, thank you. Yeah, I sure wish there was. If anybody knows, uh, please speak up, but I don't think there is one. A lot of that stuff got sold off to the Penn Central or one of those railroads on the East Coast that was running electrics after they quit using them in 1956. Yeah, I see a note in the chat. There's a note in the chat about a TV program that was recently done uh, relating to sort of the spirits of Skykomish and the spirits of uh, Wellington. Uh, frequently, there are sort of uh, ghost investigator people who come up and want to walk around up there. And I, uh, I don't help them. I give them information, but I don't want to encourage them because, you know, too many people died there. And I think there's an element of loss of respect. Uh, but I do also... I want to tell you, I've had a couple of experiences up there walking around that avalanche area where I frankly did not feel alone and had the hair on the back of my neck standing up and I was like, whoa, you know. So <laughs> I'm not a ghost kind of guy, but uh, you know, some people believe in it and uh, they have made several programs. But to me, it, it sort of sensationalizes the people that died there, which I don't agree with. So. That still uh, is one of the accidents by avalanche that's uh, the worst in history. Mm -hmm. I believe there were like 96 people killed in that avalanche. Yeah, there's uh, 96 death certificates at the King County Coroner's Office, uh, and six of them are unknowns. So the last six death certificates are just unknown. I've interviewed uh, family members, uh, had some really interesting stories. One of the gentlemen there had, uh, wife had died of six or eight months ahead of time and prior to that. And his father had sort of sent him to Seattle to sort of get on with life. And his father had a company that made barn door hardware. And so he was coming out to sell barn door hardware and he had had his wife's wedding ring uh, made into a man's ring and uh, he died there. And his brother and his father came out to claim the body and the ring was missing. And essentially he gave the coroner 24 hours to deliver the ring. And the coroner did deliver the ring. So I had heard this story. And one of the times when I was traveling for Boeing, I went to visit the family. I had talked to the uh, cousin. And I went back. And of course, when I arrived, uh, they wanted to know who the hell I was. And did anybody, did someone from their family owe my family money and all that kind of stuff. And I told them a story about the ring. And the gentleman says, you mean this ring? And he was wearing the ring. It was just one of those uh, unbelievable connections uh, with the Topping family. That is, you know, one of those things you could have never predicted. Go ahead and with other questions. Carol, you got, you got one? Anybody have a question? If you don't speak up, hey, you can Bob. wave your hand. I'm looking at the pictures. Can you hear me? Yeah, this yeah. Mark. Yes, Mark. I just, I just agree with that previous fellow. Absolutely. The implications of that avalanche uh, to this day, what is it, 114, 13 years later, is still the worst death toll in American history in an avalanche. I believe, possibly North America, but I know for a fact U.S. history. It's, uh, it's a pretty big deal. There, uh, there was one instance of more deaths, but it wasn't an avalanche. You may remember... Uh... 
I don't know, 25 years ago or so, there was a train that went off a trestle in the water down in the south somewhere. There were 121 deaths there, but this is uh, a pretty big deal. Now, the other thing that I find when I talk to family members, we're a few generations, this is, a, you know, over 100 years ago, you talk to family members today, this really still impacts a lot of family members that I have met with in private in their homes. And they, it's just amazing to see this continue through all these generations, more so than I have found other things. But, you know, researchers who talk to families who had someone die in a war or something else happened, they see the same thing. But this has really been an eye opener for me about the length of time, the number of generations that have gone by that uh, this is still a very meaningful event in their family. So I always have a lot of respect. I mean, I try to take the high road when any of this low road stuff comes up. <clears throat> Anybody else? Well, there was one picture that you had that uh, was a painting, and it looked like there was on the old line, and it looked like there was a, a trestle or something being built. And uh, I don't know what my question is, but where was that trestle? That is at, that's called the Gainer Trestle. Uh, just to the right of that trestle is the Gainer Tunnel. The the Empire Builder you saw in the foregrounds was on the old line, and they were replacing it with a just a straight in the line, and they were having trouble getting the big electrics across the line where you see the Empire Builder there. It was quite a steep, you know, narrow, too narrow for it, and uh, a sharp turn. So they put in the uh, trestle in the background and the tunnel just to the right of it. So it's called Gainer, Washington. If you type in Gainer, Washington into Google Earth, you'll probably take you right there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Carol, I saw uh, I saw your name come up a couple times there like you had a question, but I didn't hear you, so. Well, uh, Bob, real quick, are the uh, registration convention forms coming out soon? What was the question? Are the convention forms being uh, emailed? Soon for yeah, the convent, all the convention form there will be in the next GOAT. So in June, goat, you'll right. have everything you need. I would recommend that you maybe want to, if you uh, are going to go to the convention, yeah, in the last uh, issue, they told you how to go get your room reserved and so on. So I'd say maybe you could go ahead and do that. I've also, done that, yeah. Also wanted to mention, if people are coming out, and if they haven't been to the West End Archives, uh, we're going to have an open house the Friday before the convention. And the, fr and the Thursday after the convention, it'll be open. <clears throat> so you would be able to stop in uh, at the uh, West End Archives at the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive. And there'll be someone there to show you around and talk to you. I'm going to give a little talk uh, in, during the convention sometime about the collections that are in the West End. And I've also been asked to give a similar talk to what I've done here, but to include much more about the early explorations and who was up there and how this past was actually found and and who were the guys to the north of it and to the south of it and why they didn't find it. And so I'm going to attempt to do that. Uh, the other element is that if you're in the area and you're going to stay a few extra days, the the 21st is a Great Northern Day in Skykomic. So that the convention ends on like the 19th or something there, the Wednesday. On uh, Saturday, the 21st, <laughs> is Great Northern Day, which is a kind of an informal kind of thing. We have some activity in the morning, and then we have a sort of a rail fan meetup event in the afternoon at the depot. Uh, so if anybody's hanging around, you know, I'll let you know that. But if you do want to see the uh, West End Archives, I'd be certainly be glad to help you arrange that. Okay. The well, last... Bob, I'm sorry. Just, just real go quickly. Ahead, I go ahead, to... Vince. Yeah, Vince. I, yeah, I just wanted to say that... Uh, I have to get out and return to uh, sharing the rest of the evening with my wife. But I so enjoyed uh, your presentation tonight uh, and all the information that you uh, put together. Uh, a most uh, fascinating and enjoyable uh, time for me. And I thank you very much for what you've done. And all the gentlemen who preceded you with their uh, presentations have done a wonderful job. Uh, and I look forward to our next get together. And I hope you guys have a great uh, rest of the evening. Yeah, thanks, Vint. Good night. Bye-bye. Yeah, and Luke Forrest, I'll interject real quick before other people go off here. Targeting uh, 
Tuesday, we've been doing Thursday, but since we hit 60 people tonight, our new record, which is really good, really pleased to say that, uh, June the 25th, Tuesday, June the 25th is when we'll try this again. We'll have the next topic, and I'm not, obviously, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but uh, we've had some excellent ones, including this one tonight. I, I, I just, I thoroughly enjoyed this, Bob. I can't, I can't thank you enough, but I know you're one of the you're a key cog and a guru within <laughs> within the society, and I really appreciate all your efforts and everything you do. And I also sure. into you being in a place where uh, the archives actually are, you know, east or west end. I'm clear down in the middle of Indiana, so it's I am totally I am totally dependent upon you. Well, you know, one thing we're doing is we're transferring a lot of the data we have on the internet today to a new site that's gonna be much more easy to search and it's gonna be much more user-friendly, much more Google-like when you go to search for something. And I've been testing it now. We've got about 70,000 records in it already. And you can do things like type in Minot, Prac, 1924, click a button and there it is. That'll be the AFEs wow. or pictures or whatever. And it's really much easier to search than the way we do it today. Although today does work, uh, it'll be a much better approach once we get all the stuff in there. But uh, of course, that's like the 25 year plan to convert uh, a million records also. So oh, anybody yeah. who wants to work from home to help with that, uh, let me know. Bob, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Mark. Specific, this is Mark specifically to you. Uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, you gave a great presentation on lanterns. Was that you? Who did that? Yeah, I did lanterns. Uh, I don't know. I haven't done it here, but I did a lantern presentation that uh, Sky last Comey, summer uh, days last year. Last summer. Yeah, I sat there and I was enthralled. Quick question. Subject of reference sheets. Bob, well, Bob Norton and Sky Comish, uh, Yeah. Many years ago, he took me in his garage and showed me all his glassware that he collected up on the line yeah. up above there. And, and of course, he's gone and passed it on it's now there in the museum for everybody to see that bottle collection uh is fascinating and it's a, quite frankly a treasure of that railroad line uh is there any maybe a reference sheet has been done on that or is there any thought about doing one there's a, as far as i know there's not a reference sheet on bottle collecting or the bottles that were found uh there may be bottle collecting societies who may have done that, but I'm not a member of one of those. But the Norton bottle collection is at the museum. And uh, some of those lanterns you were talking about are right here in this room, actually. There's three of them that he gave me. Uh, you, uh, you, you turned me on to lanterns. You personally <laughs> are my lantern guru. <laughs> oh, that's a mistake. <laughs> well, I, I okay. learned a lot about lanterns for the rest of you. I learned a lot about lanterns and gave this presentation last year at Great Northern Days about the parts of a lantern and what they are and the different kinds of lanterns and so on. You lit a fire I, in uh, me. I actually no, told you everything I know. <laughs> yeah, good. You lit, you lit a lantern in me on that subject. Great. Thank you. Yeah, good. We could, you know, uh, we could do that here sometime in the future, John, if you, you get down the road and you want to do sort of an orientation to railroad lanterns, I'd be glad to do it. Sure. Hey, I just sent you a private uh, message requesting uh, contact information. Yeah, you bet, John. Bob, okay. I got one for you. Yeah. Yeah, this is Scott, Scott Tanner. Um, I know that you worked most of your career, if not all of it, with the Boeing Company. Yeah. How did you get so deeply involved in this fascination with the Great Northern Railway? Well, it happened uh, at Stevens Pass. My son and I, he must have been 12 or so, we went on a father-son weekend, uh, sort of the history of Stevens Pass. We stayed up at uh, Stevens Pass in a ski lodge, and there was a professor and uh, the mayor of Leavenworth, they were telling all about it and we drove all around and we looked at things and we came back and we have a good meal and we drove all around. They had a wonderful story, but they were not organized and they were not teachers. And I'm a master's degree in instructional design. So I started organizing it for them. 
And as I, you know, I do it this way and do it this way and tell it in this sequence and so on. And then um, after a while, I kept learning and learning and learning. And pretty soon they started asking me questions. So that's how I got started. It was just one of those things. And then, uh, you know, I uh, that must have been 1990, maybe, when I got started. So it wasn't a long time ago. But that was it. It was one of those things where these guys had a wonderful story and they weren't telling it that well. And I wanted to help them tell the story. By the way, Thank Scott, goodness you did. By the way, Scott, have you seen the uh, albums that are on eBay? That's our little secret, Bob. Yeah. Okay. Well, don't bid because I intend to win them. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Maybe we should coordinate by email. <laughs> uh, not a bad idea. Okay. Hey, I'll let you tell me. Okay. Anybody Bob? else? Yeah, Bob, what was it like to be a switchman up on those uh, switchbacks uh, during the winter? And, and um, ask, the question, ask the question one more time. I couldn't quite hear you. What was it like to be a switchman on the switches of Stevens Pass when uh, there was all the switchbacks during the winter? I would imagine it would be miserable. They <clears> had, uh, they had uh, special crews that were trained for the switchbacks. And of course, during the winter, they brought up the most senior people who had done that. And they generally had assistant superintendents in a, right there during the worst part of the winter. They would bring their private cars up on both sides and park them there. So they had a lot of help. But that had to be a miserable job uh, in the winter. And even in the rain and the slick and all that, uh, being outside throwing switches would have just been not a good deal. How would they deal with the when they froze? What would they do? When they uh, I do it? not know. Is there any operations guys who would know? I don't know. I mean, other than chipping away and maybe could they get a steam hose off the locomotive or something? I do not know. What Bob? was what was the address for uh, that camera in uh, Sky Comish that you were talking about? Go to uh, go to YouTube and yeah. type in Skykomish Rail Cam or Skykomish Cam and just search for it. It'll pop right up. Okay, thank you very much. It's been hey. very nice. done a beautiful job with this. Yeah, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Great, and I see Joel there. Joel, I looked for my Skykomish hat again tonight, but I couldn't find it. Well, don't feel bad. I don't have mine either. Yeah. <laughs> So are I have. Coming, a, are you coming out for the convention, Joel? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about Bridge 401. Yeah. The the bridges between the towers are they a uh, different lengths, or is it just an illusion in the pictures? The way the pictures are made, the angle of the pictures, that sort of looks like it, there may be different lengths send me you know? an email send me an email Gerald. i'll be able to tell you the exact length of them okay yeah you bet do you know if there's going to be any uh excursions or I, that's probably not the right word but when they have the uh convention i was at the convention in uh everett a, lot, a long time ago warren wing was still alive yeah yeah. And they took us up on the on the pass, and we went over to the east side of the pass a little bit, and they showed where the some of the workers, especially the Chinese, that they had little ovens that they made in the rocks and things yeah. like that. That was interesting. So I got the I got the schedule right here because I'm the one creating the schedule, helping the Mary McLaughlin. Uh, we're gonna do one. We're gonna do one trip on a bus and it's gonna be from Everett out to the Snoqualmie uh, uh, Railroad, uh, Pacific Northwest Railroad, I guess, or, or museum. The one they're, gonna run, they're, gonna run, uh, they're gonna run They're gonna run. steam for us when we're out there. They have an NP steam locomotive. They also oh. now are the owners of GN 1246, oh, which really? will be okay. sitting there for us to look at. And we're gonna have a full run of their shops and full run of their display area be able to ride the train. They're going to service lunch. So that's the only re only scheduled tour we actually are going to have. Uh, we're trying to sort of simplify the way the conventions are 
operated because they've become quite administratively challenging. And then we're going to have some uh, private vehicle tours you can take on your own. And we'll provide information for that. But the only one we're actually running as a group is the, the all-day one on Sunday. One thing to remember is this convention actually starts on Saturday with a joint uh, swap meet because the NP Society meets in the same hotel the five days before we do. So we decided to have on Saturday a joint swap meet. So it'll probably be a pretty big swap meet and be interested, interesting. And we'll do that as the NP convention ends and as our convention starts. And then Sunday, we'll take our tour out to Snoqualmie. And then after that, the program is, uh, you know, we'll focus sort of on the Northwest for the first day. There's some modeling presentations. One local guy, Jim Ramirez, uh, Ramirez is going to present too. So we've got a pretty good uh, uh, schedule of events. We're going to have a little slower pace. We think St. Cloud was maybe too much stuff too fast and too often. So there's going to be some time just to sit and talk. And the hotel we've got is a great place to do that. And then we're simplifying a lot of the administration because uh, it's more than one person can do. And we really can't get one person to put their hand up and say they'd be the chairman. So we're going to try to get things to the point where it'll work out easier for a group. But anyway, yeah, I think it'll be a good time. Well, Bob, I've got to head off, but I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on to here and presenting. It's Yeah, Jacob, I haven't seen you for a while. I, I'm glad you had invited me. Thank you. Yeah, last, time I saw, last time I saw Jacob, uh, he was at PNRA, and his uh, smile was ear to ear with what he was seeing there. Bob, I have a request, too. When we do yeah. this next one on uh, Tuesday, June the 25th, if you could just please come on there and update convention details, that kind of thing, that would be that would be much appreciated because that in all likelihood will be the last Zoom like this we're doing prior to the convention. The next one would be just slightly after it. I'll be I'll be glad to do that, but I will need a reminder. So about a week ahead of time, uh, send me an email. Okay, be sure and give me, be sure and give me your email and your phone number. John, I think uh, I think I've got yours, so I should be able to send you a note. Okay, very good. Please do. Thank uh, you, Bob. Remember, uh, maybe I'll just take one or two more questions, and then uh, John wants to meet with a couple other people who are still here. Thanks, Bob. Made the membership even more valuable. Great. Thank you, Mark. Go. Back. Good night. Bye now. Thanks, Bob, for the presentation. It was awesome. Yeah, thanks for the, the presentation, Bob. I'm going to head out also. That's John. Okay, yeah, John, are you, are you coming out in September? Oh, yeah, yes. I'll be there. Okay, good. I'm coming out on the on the builder. So. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah, well, you land about three blocks away, so. That's right. And I got the hotel reservation all, all good, good to go. Good, good. I'll see you then. All right, take care. Thank you. Thanks again for the presentation. Yeah, John, you might as well just take over here and uh, have the rest of your meeting. Uh, since I'm the looks like I'm the host, I won't do any adjusting here as people drop off until you guys are completely done talking. Then I'll uh, close out the meeting. Okay. Yeah, I just want I just wanted to talk to uh, talk to Scott. That was all before we got off here because I didn't have a way to reach him. And actually, Scott, I. I read I read about you online somewhere here recently. Some people called you at the last minute, wanted to do a big operating session uh, at your house, and they said you had it all set up for them within like 24 hours. Uh oh, unmute, unmute, unmute. How's that better? Better. I I don't read lips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I had a I had a, a an op session with some guys from Louisville last Friday. Uh, I run, you know, you know, I model the, uh, I model from Wenatchee to Skykomish, but you remember the cardinal rule about model railroading? It's my railroad, and I model it as if it went through the the old short tunnel. I model <laughs> like the depression came along and the long tunnel was never built. But uh, in any case, I run a very, very strict, comprehensive timetable train order operation, and I use waybills, not car cards, nothing else. It's about as real as you could possibly get it. I was uh, uh, I learned from a fellow by the name of Jack Ozanich, uh, who some people know, and he taught me a lot of stuff. So if you come in my house sometime, you want to operate, 
more than welcome, but be warned, it is really strict timetable train order. We have fun. It's, do you do, uh, you are in Ohio somewhere, aren't you? I'm in Northville, uh, Michigan, just uh, oh. west of Detroit. Okay, oh. you're up there. So you, yeah, yeah, so you'll be at the NMRA National here <laughs> in a couple of years then. Uh, actually, I'm the chairman of the convention. Okay, very good. It'll be July next uh, next year. Okay, yeah, we'll, de we'll definitely be there. Would you like to, um, at our next Zoom for this, would you like to do like a layout tour of yours and uh, and you can kind of couple as like you're doing explain how you do an operating session there yeah i i would really love to do sometimes but not right now with the national i i'm involved in the regional convention this fall i'm doing all the layout tours for that and then i as i said i'm the chairman for the convention next year and we're just really really starting I, to ramp up I, yep i, I got all i can handle <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I was just just going to ask. That's all. And on top of that, I build. I help build model railroads for other people as a business. So we just finished one that took seventeen months. So, oh wow, yeah, never a dull moment. <laughs> but but keep me in mind for that. I love to because uh, my layout, most of the railroad oriented structures are all built from blueprints or photographs of real structures on what I model. Awesome. Yeah. I talked about the Cascadian Hotel and Maloney's General Store. That's all on the layout. The stations are all there in Wenatchee. Uh, the big Apple Warehouse is there. A whole bunch of stuff is all there. Even uh, even Speech Vinegar is there. Wow. Are you sure you don't want to do it? Uh, yeah, not not, <laughs> not right love, now. I'd love to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't talk too much. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, I keep me in mind, but not not quite yet. I uh, yeah, I I understand. That's kind of what we're doing on ours, the Glacier Line. We kind of wanted to get things up and running, and I mean, it's definitely got the Montana feel yep. and background. We do Marias Pass, but now we're on the process of uh, building and putting buildings there that were or are there at one time. So when yeah. people come down, it's like an actual historical tour you know i said you go up there you will see this you yeah. know did so, you get your mmr yes i thought so congratulations yeah, i'm yeah thank you i'm 7 30 and richard ramirez he was just like right after me and yeah. i knew the name rang a bell but i it just wouldn't hit me and then of course i looked at the modelers pages and i'm like duh so do you do you know anybody else that I'm just curious, anybody else in the society who is an MMR? I do not. I think the three of us are, are it. That uh, would be that would be a huge number for 2000 people, considering there's only been like 758 now, I think, since 1961. <laughs> would, would you believe that I belong to a Friday night group and eight of us are MMRs? Oh, you're kidding. No, and the first one got his MMR in 1984. Wow. Yep, there are eight of us. And I Mark, guarantee you, you do not make a mistake or put out a lousy model. <laughs> they'll climb all over you. We've got down here, we've got eight people on our, what I call our core crew. And within the next uh, 14 months, two more, four of the eight of us will have it. My wife, Connie, who you can't see, there she yep. is. There she is. Hello. She's secretary of the region. She'll have hers May the 1st will be your seventh. With That's the fantastic. That's and then right. another then another gentleman that operates us. He's a he's an official. He'll get his official certificate a year from that if he doesn't like do the civil first. So yeah, we're we're a small group, but we're mighty. <laughs> I so. I, I'm just absolutely nuts about Great Northern. I just love it. I've I've loved modeling it. It's just so do great. I. When we lived in Montana, of course, it was like heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me do a little PR first. I'm, I'm, take take about, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, let me take a second to do some PR. If you guys like the uh, Tri-Regional in Indianapolis, you're going to love the convention here in the Detroit area. Um, it, it's going to be shorter than the typical national, and there are going to be quite a few other changes. It's going to be very similar to that. The uh, RPM guys are going to be an integral part of what we're doing. They're bringing their two layouts, and this time they'll be the full layouts. And uh, you know, I think it's going to be good, and it's going to be way cheaper 
than almost any other NMRA national convention has been in years. Oh, that's good. That's great. that's good. If the two of you come, you're going to pay maybe about forty percent of what you'd ever paid before. Oh, very good. Oh, Believe good. it or not, we've never been to a national <laughs> one. We've only been in for about you know, five years, and I'm kicking myself because I've known about the NMRA since, uh, obviously, the the 70s, and back then, you know, I thought it was just paper, and I thought, you know, I'm not interested in getting a newsletter, and then uh, not too long ago, when I joined in 18, I was looking at the MMR, and I'm thinking, I like a challenge, so I'm just, I, I've heard people talking about this for years, so I'm just going to see if I can do it. Yep. Not a good reason to join, but why I did and after I got in here with these people in the Central Indiana Division and the Midwest region, I'm just kicking myself because I met so many people and learned so many great things. And we we just do so much and have so much fun. And I, I missed out on all that for 45 years that I've been in this hobby, you know? Yep. Well, well, as it stands right now, we expect to have 50 layouts on layout visits. And by the way, all the layouts are self-drive. There are no buses. Okay. No charge. It's all included in your price. Uh, and so we'll have about 50 layouts. Uh, and most of the basements run between 1,000 and 3,000 square feet, if you can believe that, for a basement. Mm -hmm. And we expect to have at least 90 clinics. So wow. there'll be plenty of things for people to do. Great. Is your layout included? <laughs> I will be open probably for one time for four hours. <laughs> I hear I've got that. responsibilities that I'd like to be involved in more, but I doubt maybe. Yeah, I, I, yeah I've got, I would, I obviously, I would make it a point to see your layout. I appreciate that. Order. You're more yeah. than welcome. <laughs> yeah. We, we will have some other layouts that are just breathtakingly beautiful, including, if you could believe this, we're going to have a three rail O scale layout that may be the most beautiful layout you've ever seen in your life. Well, I'd love to because we're three rail we're three people rail. too. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen the glacier line before in the videos or whatever? Just a little tiny bit. Looks beautiful. Okay, yeah. They're actually it's posted online now. There's an entire full length on online uh -huh. on now. OGR posted. So yeah, cool. we're we're proud of it, but we're still we're improving because when we first started with the buildings, like so we were concerned with backdrops and electronics and all that other stuff. But now we're at the we're at the building phase of it. We've got a couple of super nice ones, including the, uh, the East Glacier Montana station. That was just featured in the NMR, NMRA magazine not long ago. Cool. So Very, very good. Well, okay. people, I'm going to go. I'm going to hit the hay here in a minute. Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me too. Thank you. Hey, Bob, is, is Bob still there? Or did he I, take off? I was yeah, going to yeah, tell yeah, him when he was, yes, when he was he talking did. about that Fisher painting and so on. Well, there's the print of it right there. How cool is that? I could I I couldn't afford the fifteen thousand dollars that Fisher wanted for the, the oh original. My God, yeah. yeah. I was yeah. doing real well with the consulting, but when that went away, I, I came home to babysit for my daughter's new baby, and I didn't go back and work. So I and and I I told him that up front. I said, no, I just can't swing that one. But uh, I wish I could have. <laughs> but the yeah. print's fine. The print's fine. So you guys have a nice evening. Hopefully everyone had a good day. We'll talk to you later. Yep. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Scott. You. Take, Thank take you. care. Cool. I really like that. Yeah. Yeah.
Hey, Ron, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I took okay, a short I break. Just, I I'm just uh, came back to read the chat and see what's going on there. So, anyway, how you doing? Doing pretty good here. I'm in yeah, the process. wonderful. Hopefully I'll, hopefully, I'll be up in sky here in a couple of weeks. Hopefully, they'll hand me that lamp you're looking for. But I don't know. I'm, I'm going to also go kind of looking around town on various buildings to see if somebody put it on their garage or something. Oh, I don't know. They had about, I think they had five of them on the yeah. Depot. And they're yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely on the depot after it arrived back on the south side. Got pictures of that. Right. Now I'm going to try to reach the, uh, the city crew has completely changed over. I'm going to try to reach a couple of the old city crew to see if they have any memory. Yeah, I mean, I realize why they took them off because these wouldn't have not been with the depot in its original form, which is what they were trying to do when they. Yeah, I think that's exactly what they did. So. Yeah, but on the other hand, they were on that depot for many, many years, and they are a historical uh, item as far as I'm concerned. So. Well, I I would have left them just because it's been there for such a long time, but. Uh... Yeah, and uh, that company, we'll see the. The guy who founded the company died in 1936 or something like that. So oh, really? The day after Christmas, he had a family of six kids. Oh, my. That had to have been hellacious. Oh, golly. Yeah. <laughs> so, Are you, uh, so you're going to travel over and do a little poking around on the way to the convention? Yeah, there's a couple of uh, things I want to measure at that museum in Reardon there. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, so I've already talked to them. And they're having a deal where if you're a GNRHS member, it's free admission <laughs> to go to well, cool. yeah, in, cool. in conjunction with this uh, convention. So that's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah, because they'll get people stopping in there if they get that broadcasted out. I actually have not been there. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work with them at the West End Archive. They uh, gave us a whole bunch of blueprints, and we took them to Burien, and we scanned them. And then we're going to keep the scans and then return them the blueprints and the scan themselves. So great. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So it's been uh, kind of fun working with their stuff. They, some of them had some really great blueprints of things I've never seen before. So yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of, uh, let's see, a, a bracket for uh, uh, the uh, relay cases that GN used on its uh, semaphores. And uh, I got some information from a fellow who owns an old semaphore, but the curvature and stuff on those castings is so complicated. I'm going to have to do some hands-on measuring. Of the thing. Yeah, are you uh, using this data? Are you uh, doing that 3D printing or anything like that to make? Yeah, I've got data? a I've got a 3D printer. I haven't uh, put it into service yet, but I am making drawings uh, of the the kind of files that it takes to run it. So yeah. I have to look yeah. At them. The Boeing guys uh, have some of the Boeing Club there right beside us uh, at Burien. And it's amazing what I've seen come out of there. And one of the guys is pretty darn good at it. In fact, he's done hundreds of various kinds of things. Uh, young man. And uh, just it's crazy what he comes out of with this really, really fine detail. I've uh, Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of these printers are in the just the hundreds in prices. They're not oh, yeah. expensive at all. But they yeah. do some heck uh, some really fine re resolution work. So I've got that printer. Uh, for me, though, I'm 78, so it's a my learning curve is a lot slower than these young fellows. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, takes yeah. me about 50 man hours to do a decent drawing, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. I but I, I hired a guy to to do one for me, and we did do one. Uh, the fellow that runs uh, Details West. Now has a uh, great one and switch stand uh, and a, um, uh, a switch ah. lock piece of equipment. Yeah. Out there. Yeah. And uh, that's stuff that GN used. Sure. Cool. Anyway, so that's what uh, the intent was is to make some things available like that. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, I'm going to sign off. It's good to see you, and I'll look forward to seeing you this fall. Okay, fall. and if that lamp ever comes up, boy, I will certainly make yeah. it into a. But I would, I too. will also personally go look in their junk pile. If I if I come up with one, I hope to hand it to you. That would be cool. <laughs> I don't really know. Really I don't know if that'll actually happen or not, but uh, we'll see. Okay. Well, I, if I can just borrow it and 
return it to the pile, that would be fine too. All right. All right. We'll see you. All right. Now. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and turn this thing off. Looks like the other guys are done. Everybody's about done. There's one fellow left, it looks like. But, yeah, uh, uh looks at Robert Grunderman. Are you still there, Robert? Maybe I see uh Tom White. Are you still there, Tom? Hey, well, must have just left, yeah. Must have done. Okay, in the background, you can see my messy shop. I'm trying to improve that. But <laughs> <laughs> it looks good to me. It feels real comfortable. Okay. <laughs> good night. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this thing off here. Okay. Good night. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, bye. Thank you.